never applying positive feedback to an element that is essentially random because that fools the player into thinking that they did something significant. Um, I guess the I question... F- I feel like the last tip and this tip are at odds with each other. Let's, let's see if we can... Let's see if we can mesh these two ideas. I wanted to go over some uh, basic game mechanics tips for folks. And I came across an article... That is from the one and only Will Wright. Have you ever Uh, heard of him? Of former Maxis fame, I assume? Yes. uh, Creator of The Sims. The Sims. Sim City and uh, pretty much anything that had Sim in front of it, he probably had a hand in. Uh, Sim Ant, my favorite. Yeah, remember Sim Ant? Great, good times. Uh, But anyway, yes, that Will Wright. Uh, He... Uh, did a masterclass, which was about game design and game mechanics, and uh, he, very helpfully, in an article, wrote about five tips uh, for writing game mechanics. And I thought that we would just look at those five and see if they're any good advice. I mean, it's sure it's Will Wright, so I'm going to assume that they must have worked okay for him. Uh, <laughs> Maybe. What's he doing these days? Um, chillin'. Chillin' in the, in, in the world of The Sims, probably. Uh, maybe. He's maybe. In, Anyways, let's, he's in a let's simulation. see what Mr. Let's see what he wrote. His first tip is to work backwards. So, he says, when selecting game mechanics, think about the experience your game is creating. Then work backwards to find the mechanic that will improve that experience. Sometimes that means borrowing a common mechanic from another game, and sometimes it means creating your own. Have you ever tried working backwards when you were doing, like, game design and working out the mechanics of the, of the game? Like, st- like, start at the end and then go backwards? I mean, it start with the mechanic and then work backwards no, from it entirely? No, 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 just... no, no, no. He, he's, he's saying, think about the experience that you're creating and then you work backwards after you realize what you're trying to get to at the end. So, so like, you, you know what kind of game you want to build, and then you work backwards to get the mechanics that support that end goal. It's not a bad approach, absolutely. Um, because if you know, like, the experience and the desired outcome you have, then you can figure out ways to tailor the mechanics to fit that. You know? Sure. Sure. Okay. Like, me personally, since I don't design games myself, um, that is is a little bit of a foreign concept, but w- I know that sometimes when I'll write, even when I'll write, I, I kind of start at what is the message or the resolution to this story before you even start figuring out what your characters and the basic concept of the thing is, because you, you want to know that at the end you're going to get the experience, you're going to get the message across that you were looking to get to. So Yeah, you don't start a story and go, I don't know where it's going to end up. You kind of, I, I assume you don't anyways. Some people um, might. <laughs> but like, Some you want to have an might. idea of the story overall and you have the, what your end goal is and so you figure out how you want to get there. Right. You know? right. Uh, it's the same thing when you're designing quests, I think, in D&D or tabletop games. Same thing as when you're designing mechanics for tabletop games or systems you want to add or make. Sure. Like, I go, I want to have a system where you can build stuff and make it easy. So I work backwards. Well, what do you need to build stuff? I can need the resources. Which Mm -hmm. resources do I need? So you kind of go, all right, being able to build things with this, like a wood building, you need this, that, and that. How should you get it? You kind of work just backwards. Like, you're playing the game in reverse, essentially. Right, right. I can understand that, especially for um, things that are like puzzles or mazes, too. I, I Like, every time I think about building a maze of my own, uh, my first thought is you have to stop, start at the end, and you have to path your way backwards, and then work your maze out from there. Have you ever, have you ever seen that? Where it's like, you have, a, you have a hedge maze, right? 
or something like that, and you say, okay, what I'm going to start with is here's my endpoint, and I'm going to draw the path that gets me out of the maze. And then we just build everything out from that. So you know that you have a, a path that will take you there, and then everything else just expands out from that. But you've already completed your main goal. So... So it's, it's something like that. Puzzle design, this is very helpful for. Uh, but just generally in your storytelling, uh, and this, of course, doesn't just apply to uh, video games, this applies to tabletop as well, uh, you want to create a certain experience with your system or your game, you're going to start there, and then you're going to work your way backwards to the steps that are going to get you there. So perfectly good piece of advice that we don't really talk about very much. Um, number two. Uh, study other mechanics. Always a good one. Uh, the best way to get good at using game mechanics is to start recognizing them in other games. Play games with an analytical mind. Break each system down into its component parts. And eventually, you'll see how many mechanics are shared across games and systems. I see you shaking your head. Yeah, <laughs> Strive sorry. to become a mechanic. I'm, <laughs> I'm not gonna play a game to anal uh, do an analysis of the mechanics, generally speaking. But you, I don't enjoy doing that. But you would do that when you're playing tabletop games, wouldn't you? Like, you have uh, done that before. Only when I'm trying to figure out something. I'm not going to, like, play a game to dissect its mechanics. Although I do notice them and comment on them. It's not, like, I don't deep anal uh, do a deep analysis of them when I play it, because I'm not playing it for that reason. But, like, sure, I'll go, this is a weird system. Why is it that? It's kind of like, um, I think when we were talking about Neo, maybe? Oh, okay. Yeah. I was like, this system is neat, because you can have high, low, and mid stance, and you can do different weapon combos in different ways, so it kind of gives you a variety of offense and defense, mm -hmm. and ways you can dish it out. And Certainly. play changes the play style, even within the one weapon set, for instance. Interesting mechanic. Did I do a deep analysis of it? No. No. I noticed it was a thing, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, he does, this last sentence, though, kind of goes to what you were saying, though. Is strive to become a mechanics collector, gathering things from here and there that you'll eventually use in your own design. So in similar fashion, you know, where you see a system that's really interesting that stands out, you take note of that and say, yeah. oh... That would be interesting if it was put into this other thing, or if we uh -huh. used it here. Uh, you know, I'll see systems that I think are neat in, in existing ones. I, I think I've already talked about, like, Surge 2, which I went back and played recently, and that has that whole thing where, you know, it's a Souls-like and it has a lot of those mechanics, but then it also has that neat system where you can do finishing moves, cut off limbs, and get schematics for the pieces of armor and weaponry that the enemies used in the game, which is just a, a unique system that you didn't see elsewhere. Or in, in Lies of P, which I had been playing recently, where you can collect weapons, but they're separated between, like, the heads and the uh, shafts so that you can mix and match them so you can get different uh, effects that you can, you can utilize together. Um, these are just neat systems, and I suppose as long as it's not like the Nemesis system, which has uh, some legal... I guess it's not in as much legal hot water as it used to be <laughs> to use the Nemesis yeah, system. Not, not really sure what, what happened with um, that, but probably because, still. Because they are using it for some other games, but as long as the, as long as the mechanics aren't apparently like copywritten or trademarked, <laughs> I guess you can... I, you can still take from them, you just can't use them verbatim. That's true. Um, I think that what's interesting here, though, is... Like Will Wright is saying, playing games with an analytical mind. I don't necessarily think, like you were saying, that you have to play games with an analytical mind, but I do think that it's, it's useful to be observant about specific things that you think are really interesting in games. Um, and, and how they interact with the systems, because I, I will often, like, take a step back afterward and look at, like, why things worked or didn't work for me and say, maybe it was because they implemented this or this or this, and it would be cool to see that again, and then you recognize it when you play another game, and you see that that's in that system. So, yeah. uh, number three, incorporate probability. 
Many game mechanics will use some form of probability or randomness. A simple dice roll is an example. Use randomness yeah. when you want to create interesting variability in play or add tension to a certain moment within your game. So it's it's RNG stuff, basically. Uh, you know, you're, you're, I, I have a 20-sided die. Uh, how much probability, though, serious question for you. How much probability do you actually want in your gaming? Depends on what you're doing. Okay. okay. Our, our default, it depends. Yes. Um, <laughs> Take a shot. <laughs> in a shooting game, for instance, you probably don't want a lot of probability going on because right. if you're aiming your gun in the right spot, you don't want the bullet going over there yep. when it should be over here, for instance. Right. Probability... Uh, factor in that would come down to if there's any spread to your your shots or recoil or something like that I guess mm -hmm. so you've got a cone that you're aiming in and you're whatever like a shotgun the probability to hit etc etc um, dice rolls are fine it's usually a, not a giant pool sure for instance it's not like you're doing 1d 100 no. um, with a you know dice roll of a d20 for instance. I would love to see a system where they're like, attacks do like, 1d 100 damage, and that's just for enemies, and for you, <laughs> and just yeah. see the I wild mean, swing. Like in Rogue Trader, which I've been playing again, uh, because it came out. Um, yeah. for instance, that uses a, a d 100 system, but you're rolling under a percentile. So it's not like you're rolling 1 to 100 and just take whatever number you get. It's you're rolling 1d100 and you're taking under your score is a success. Under so your if I have a 35, anything under a 35 success. So it's not even bad. Hmm. You know? Um, so yeah, probably how much do you want? You want enough to make it interesting, I think? Sure, sure. But you don't want so much that it becomes unreliable for things you want to be right reliable again it, it headshots should not be probability they should be skill yes yeah uh there's certain games where probability is just not going to work uh especially games that are about strategy uh games like chess really can't have probability to them they have to have very specific movement and function um some puzzle games or a lot of puzzle games, will actually not want to have probability. I don't need randomness when I'm trying to solve an actual puzzle with one specific uh, answer to it. Which which may go a little bit into the idea of, like, uh, emergent or linear gameplay, which we're going to get into in a different segment, but, uh, but I, I feel like that does depend heavily on what kind of game that you're building. For most games, though, it's perfectly fine to do so. I just wouldn't want to see probability in a game like, let's say, Super Mario, because when I bop the little Goomba on his head, I want to know that the Goomba is dead, and not that I critically failed, fell over, and then the Goomba eats me. You know, that's... Yeah, that's not ideal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so maybe not great in all cases. Oh, okay. Moving on. Four, don't reward randomness. Never, yeah, see. yeah, never apply positive feedback to an element that is essentially random because that fools the player into thinking that they did something significant. Similarly, if you apply randomness to moments that are supposed to be precise and vital to success, the game f begins to feel arbitrary. Instead, introduce small, mathematically simple elements of chance throughout your game. Those elements will play against one another and eventually present as game intelligence to the player. So what was the last one? Incorporating probability. Yeah, so you want probability, but don't reward randomness. Probability is randomness. This is true. Never applying positive feedback to an element that is essentially random. Because that fools the player into thinking that they did something significant. Um, I guess the I question... I feel like the last tip and this tip are at odds with each other. Let's, let's see if we can... Let's see if we can mesh these two ideas. Okay. So, probability, if we're talking about user input having 
a not necessarily firm output could be seen as what Wright is saying about incorporating probability. If he's talking about randomness in the idea of just random stuff that can happen uh, shouldn't necessarily be rewarded. I can almost see what he's talking about there, like, but but if you're adding in any of these elements, I think it's hard for that to work. Like, if I said, well, there's this giant hole in the ground in my landscape, and uh, boy, if if one of the enemies, like, trips and falls and falls into the hole and then plummets 50 feet and dies, uh, that's kind of a I'm reward it, for me. <laughs> yeah, I guess it really uh, comes down to what you're classifying as a reward for randomness. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because random encounters in D&D, for instance, a lot of people don't necessarily like them these days. Some people still do. But... If you have a random encounter and you survive the combat, you get experience. The experience is a reward for right. surviving and defeating the combat. Or if they drop any loot, for instance, that is a reward. Right. You've earned loot. Or even more, for instance, go back to the three, uh, three five days. If you're rolling on random loot tables and you roll high on the loot table, you know, there's probability, random chance of you getting a very cool epic item. Sure. If you use those tables. So, randomness can have rewards. Right. It, it, so, it just really depends on like, what you want to classify as a reward for randomness. Uh, opening a loot box. Randomness. Also, reward. True. Also, totally gambling addiction stuff. But that's it, not the point. Right. Maybe that's what he means by don't reward randomness. Uh, so, but, so, like, randomness can have reward. I think it just should not be more tangible than a reward that you get from something satisfying. Right. Um, what, he, what he says in this piece is, if you apply uh, randomness to moments that are supposed to be precise and vital to success, the game begins to feel arbitrary. So, I mean, we could say that, maybe he's saying that there are places where pro in, you know probability mechanics, random number generation works, and there are some places that need precision where that randomness is not going to work, but I don't think it's phrased very well between these two. And this is a master class? <laughs> this is a Sorry. master Um Well, to be fair, I, I even Ninja had design... a master class. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we don't talk about that. I want someone to do a game. A video game. It's a platformer, but every time you jump, the intensity of your jump varies on a scale between 1 and 100. Every gravity time, different. The gravity Random changes. jumping strength. Yeah, the gravity changes. Perfect. Yeah, essentially. So, well, I guess not gravity. Gravity stays the same. I mean, gravity could change too, but gravity stays the same. So the speed of your fall, always going to be the same. Speed of your jump, always going to be the same. The distance and power of your jump changes. So... Sometimes you'll jump like this and go. Other times you go, boom. I think it'd be hilarious trying this to do sad. that. And this would be the randomness that you don't want to make for things that require precise gameplay. Yes, yeah. Can you imagine if you introduced it a randomness or a probability to, like, a Mario game? Where they're trying to do these pr precise movements so that you can get to, like, the moon or the star or whatever. And then all of a sudden, it's just like, nope, sorry, Mario trips. Halfway if you up. want randomness like that in your gameplay, uh, there are mods are mods for Skyrim that uh, add in randomness. Hmm. I, I like and everything randomized. And Skyrim wasn't random enough. <laughs> well, uh, it, it'll randomize enemies or loot, what everything beyond um, that. It, it's insane. Yeah, I think Spiffing Brit did a video on it, so. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. So let's see how number five actually plays with the previous uh, points, because I feel like there might be a little bit of a push and pull here. Five. Give players more control. Allow players to mitigate randomness in your game by giving them access to tools that influence probability. For example, if you're building a digital card game that relies on random draws, allow your player to build their own deck. If you're building a war game that detects hits and misses by using a probability table, let players add equipment that improves their probability. 
This way your player has control and agency over how randomness affects the game's state, and their failures won't feel arbitrary. Yeah, that just seems... like, basic. <laughs> that, that, that does seem basic. I mean, I guess... I guess this kind of plays into the not rewarding randomness only because the players are then going to have some control over that and will get better results. Yeah, but I guess the idea is that if the players have more control, that randomness, the probability of it gets mitigated because you're strategizing. To sure, minimize it feels it. like it gets mitigated. It gives you better odds, but the inherent randomness of a dice roll means oh, that sure. it doesn't matter what your odds actually are unless they're 100%. Right, right. But, like, if you... if Like, we'll go to D&D for a minute. If you're playing a fighter and you get the ability... I don't remember what it is, but it, it increases your critical hit range. You know what I mean? So it's, it's like yep. it doesn't just hit on a 20, it hits on a 19 or an 18. Mm-hmm. The randomness is still there, mm -hmm. but you have improved your odds of getting a critical hit because sure. of how you've built it, and the player controls how they're building that. Sure. You feel like you have more of a chance to crit. Right. You technically have a better chance to crit. Yes. You have two of those numbers on the dice instead of just one. So right. instead of one in 20 chance, you have a two in 20 chance. You've doubled your odds, yes. You know, you doubled yeah. your odds. The fact that dice rolls are not based on prob you know, probability, like, actually, mm. and they are purely random, sure. means that, yes, if you roll the dice 20 times, you might get two crits. Right. You might get 15 crits. Right. You might get zero crits. Right, right, right. And, and it is possible with random number generation... That that will happen regardless of whether you have increased your critical hit range or not. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's more likely to happen if right. you've done that work. So, maybe mm -hmm. it, so I guess in some ways, yes, you're giving players control, but there is a bit of a, the players feel like they have more control than anything else. It's the illusion it's, of control. Randomness 100%. will do that. Which is why I enjoy dice mechanics, because you can give players things to adjust their odds, make them feel better, and make them strategize in certain ways that, yeah, they, they have a bit more of an edge, they have more chances to succeed than to fail now, but, again, the inherent thing with dice is that they're random. The in their right. inherent thing with any number system that's based on randomness means it doesn't matter if you have a 99% chance of success, you have a 1% chance of failure, and you can fail often. Right, 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 right. Now, you, you know, your bell curve would suggest that the median outcome is most likely, but, uh, again, there is no there guarantee There are always that. outliers. There's always going to be outliers. What was That's it? Right. There's a lady, I don't remember what game it was, she was playing, what, craps or something? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and what was that, you have to throw the dice? Yeah, a yeah. A certain way? yeah. And she, I think she went for like 600 rounds or something like that, winning. It, it was happens. something stupid and sane. It happens. But it's like, the probability of this happening, she could have won oh, yeah. like the lottery like five or six times. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like, that doesn't happen very often. Right, right. It's very uncommon to see, but theoretically can happen. Yeah, it's um, like the, the thing when they say, technically, to shuffle a, de a deck of cards the same way twice in a row, it has more, a bigger set of odds than, like, the number of stars in the galaxy or something like that. Right, right, because you're shuffling 52 cards, so you're doing, like, 52 by the 52... <laughs> 50 second yeah. power of and it's being like, able to have different 100 percent. that that is really not likely to happen but could it happen randomly 100 percent. it could ha it, it could absolutely happen randomly. sure sure um the the thing i would say though like will wright mentions the digital card game uh that relies on builds i can see though like if somebody said i don't understand anything about the mechanics of like magic the gathering and just put a bunch of random cards in there. There is a very likely possibility that there will be literally no way for them to actually play the game because they will yeah. they will not have the lands or the the ability to produce mana to even get cards out 
if they just like throw a bunch of random crap in there. Um, and so I can understand why you'd want to give your players a little bit more control, but once they understand the fundamentals of what the game does so that they yeah. know how to get control, otherwise you're just leaving them there with a, a blank slate and they're probably going to fail because they don't understand the basics. Um, right. But anyway, well, those are, were the five points that were the basic tips that Will Wright gives for writing game mechanics. And um, I think that they're okay, but they do kind of contradict themselves a little bit. A little bit. Um, I think they're fine tips. They're very basic tips. Yes. To anyone that's been looking into game design, I feel like they would be like, well, yeah, that just makes sense. Sure, sure. Although, again, I maintain that the probability one and the randomness one are butting heads a little bit based on the fact that probability and randomness are both linked very heavily and both just kind of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I imagine that this, like I said, this is a Masterclass article that Will Wright had for for his video series, I believe. And um, so they're probably trying to take people from like zero to 100. You know, they're they're trying to take them from like the ground floor, not knowing anything. And it's probably pretty good advice for people that have no previous experience with this. Uh, as like a, a bit of a grounding, but I think just because we've talked about this for so long, we see where some of this can contradict itself and and yeah. cause problems when when rubber hits the road. I'm sure it's fine to start out with because then people find out about it on their own when they when they start to implement this stuff. But um, overall, though, perfectly fine advice for newcomers. At least something for them to think about. Yeah, you know. Uh, but at any rate, if you have thoughts about this, especially about probability and randomness, yes, let us know down in the comments below or on our Discord channel. And if you happen to know of another game designer that decided to do this exercise, <laughs> and you think their list was better, please let us know about that too. I'd, <laughs> I'd, I'd be perfectly happy to hear if, uh, if, if somebody else has has done a similar exercise of just some basic writing tips. Maybe Ken Levine did. I'd like to listen to that. That'd be fun. There you go. Cool. Uh, 